anthropologist who has worked on river herring as a grad student at Yale and now is a postdoc at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I just want to say, I know Linda and Chris have said this to me on the side, that says, you know, we really couldn't do this tagging project if it wasn't for Andy. Andy's been like a key component of um, having this, this project so, so successful. So thank you, Andy. Um, hopefully I'm as successful at getting this presentation to play. <laughs> excited to talk to you guys. Uh, it's hard to choose uh, what exactly about this project to present. There's people who have different levels of interest and who have, you know, followed the project to different stages. Some people may have seen the presentation last year. So if I leave anything out, harass me or send me an email because there's a lot of information that's not, not in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> and you can thank Charlie for this excellent title. So thank you, Charlie. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll just jump right into this and really start off where uh, a few of the other speakers have, have left off, which is really thank people who allowed this to happen. This is something that would not have happened if there weren't great people coming out of the woodwork to help make it, um, make different aspects work. Um, people from the CRT and volunteers from the community. Um, a couple things to just take away from this is that um, about 85% of the total cost of this was covered by um, uh, uh, grants, well, giving from various people within the community. Um, and so that was extremely, extremely helpful. Also, we had fantastic sort of scientific support. Uh, before I started this project, I was not an expert in pit tag technology, so <laughs> a little bit of help from people from uh, other various scientific institutions in the area who really helped us get up to speed and get things going. And now we're sort of transferring that information to other people. Um, so uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to really sit down and look at river herring in your hand, uh, this is a picture that I like of the two species. Um, so blueback are one of the two species and their wife are the other. And uh, river herring is sort of a larger term that we use uh, in the management context to refer to both of them. Um, and these guys have this really great life cycle, which makes us very excited about them. They're basically going from freshwater out into the ocean and back. And they start in freshwater as little eggs. They grow up into larvae in freshwater. They turn into juveniles. They get, you know, they're sort of adult form. And then at that stage, they head out to freshwater or out to saltwater, where they spend a few years. And if they're lucky enough, they come back and they spawn. And it's the spawning migration that we've been studying, and it's really uh, fantastic. Usually, you have a very hard time counting fish and understanding how many fish are out there. These fish are nice enough to come back to the same place every year to spawn, so it's easier for us to understand what their populations are doing, and whether or not they might be in trouble. Um, and in case you guys are curious, here are some interesting photos of the different uh, life stages. So those little teeny tiny little clear dots are eggs, and this is sort of a progression of juveniles getting larger. These are juveniles who are headed back out to sea, and then um, those are some adults who are coming back to spawn. And these are um, uh, sort of representative. When they come back to spawn, uh, those of you who've lived here for a long time have been fortunate enough to see uh, good abundances may recognize something like this. This is actually out at Stony Brook, and it's really a huge mass of fish. It's amazing to see, um, and just think that all these fish are sort of fanning themselves into these tiny little rivers. Um, and this sort of abundance of fish is extremely important. Um, ecologically, they're prey for different uh, predators out there. They're also important as juveniles in these lakes. Uh, where they're growing, um, lakes and streams. 
We know that they have a large influence on the zooplankton communities in the lakes and uh, potentially important roles in sort of regulating uh, biogenic chemical cycling. Okay, so we've heard a lot about the Kunamesa River. This slide is a little bit washed out, but the take home is that uh, down at the bottom here, we have uh, uh, where uh, the uh, river is connecting to the estuary, and then there's a little pond down here called Flax Pond, and a larger pond at the top called Kunamesa Pond. And, um, uh, we know that the fish are using both ponds. We were interested, uh, as in last year, in uh, how, to what extent they were using each pond. Um, and um, this has historically been one of the larger runs, if not the largest run in Falmouth. So for our community, it's a fairly important, important run. Um, and while we have count data going back to 2004, uh, we don't really know much about what fish are doing when they're actually in freshwater. So the sort of fine scale, nitty gritty of what they're doing, when they're coming, when they're leaving, which ponds they're going to, we don't know much about. Um, and uh, a lot of that data is of interest when we're sort of thinking about restoration and think, making plans about where we should make turns in the river or how we should connect things farther up. All that data is very valuable. Um, and it also helps to sort of uh, refine our counts. As Lou is saying, currently our counts have fairly large confidence intervals on them. So anything we can do to sort of uh, increase our understanding of what they're doing while they're here can help. Um, and the technology that we're using for that is really analogous to the easy pass that people are using going on the mass pike now. So it's basically a little batteryless transponder that the fish carries with it. it and um, as it goes through an antenna, the uh, tag tells the antenna, hey, I'm here, this is my number. And the antenna writes down the time that it saw that tag, and we take that data and we compile it and turn it into sort of a picture of the fish moving through the watershed. Um, so to do that, one key component are these little tags, which are relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, and then also we need um, antennas out in the watershed. So as I said, um, we have uh, the two spawning ponds, Kunamesa Pond and Flax Pond. Um, so we put antennas out there because we were really interested in whether or not fish were getting there. And then we also had um, a series of antennas in the, in the middle of the river, which I'm not going to talk about just in the interest of time today. Um, and then we also had one sort of at the the bottom of the river, because so we had a sort of a, a gauge for when fish were starting their migration up. Um, and in both years, we tagged about a thousand fish. Most of those were alewives, um, uh, predominantly. And uh, we were sort of trying to follow them through the course of this sort of migration, and then uh, have migration back to the sea. And we would get really excited and get all our stuff together, start sending emails to one another when we'd see something like this down in the lower bog. So this is a pretty good school of, of fish ready to head up. Um, and get your waders out, go collect these fish, occasionally have encouraging onlookers, um, and sort of corral, corral them into uh, a net, try to keep them as happy as possible, occasionally discuss which ones we're actually going to get, and then try to get those ones. <laughs> um, and then sort of do, do the scientific side of things, so figure out which species they are, figure out how long they are, um, and then finally give them their tag and send them on their way. And uh, I don't know if, how many of you have had uh, fun collecting data while also handling fish, but somehow fish slime and fish scales get everywhere. So you end up with, you know, I have some stuff stuck to my car from last, last spring. Um, and so these guys are tagged, they're ready to go. We put them back in the water and they head upstream. And so this is a school that was up right, right by the pond. Um, and this guy at the end here has an incision, and he's actually a fish that was tagged and made it all the way up. So you can see we take a couple scales, and um, and they're no worse for the wear. Um, this is another, I figure people come to see pictures of fish, right? So, <laughs> and I could a couple of videos, but um, they're pretty fish. I, I actually got called out at a conference recently for calling them mildly charismatic, so I'll call them very charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're, they're pretty cute. Um, and so the fish are moving through the watershed, they're going over obstacles like this, they're going through uh, these sort of open areas. These are our friends, the gulls, who are checking them out and deciding who, who's the tastiest morsel. And then up through these little small small streams, if they get really lucky, they make it up someplace like this, good mess of pond, where they get to spawn. And then they'll head, head back downstream. So these are a couple fish heading downstream. It's fun to see them go. You can tell they're a little bit skinnier at this point. They've lost a little bit of mass. Um, and, you know, in the spring, things have grown in. They're going back downstream. They'll go through some culverts, um, some things like this. And 
at the end of it, we end up with something like this, which is um, sort of a messy data set, which has a lot of interesting insights. But like I said, there's a lot here that I'm not going to cover. Um, so um, it's a little bit washed out. Um, I don't know if we can get those. Yeah, I don't want to mess up Allison's recording. But essentially what I'm showing you here is the, um, the graph on the top, which is a histogram, is showing the visual counts that the volunteers are doing. So those are the visual counts through the season. And you can see that there's real one, really one peak in when the fish are migrating. And then down at the bottom are the dates that we're tying. <coughs> and the spots here, so these lines, connecting points are fish movements from one antenna to another. So that's when we had data on when a fish was seen and then made it to another antenna. And if you watch it, it's kind of fun to watch. You can kind of see them have a good time moving up. And the different colors here are different tagging dates. So each tagging date, you can see these fish are being tagged and pretty quickly moving up through the watershed to, their, to the uh, lake. Um, it's hard to see because it's a little bit washed out. Sorry about that. Um, but then eventually we get to about May, and we start to see fish that have been seen up in, in the top of the watershed coming back down. And, um, they start showing up down here again and going back out. Um, and you know, it ends up being in the order of thousands of different detections where we actually have fish going from one antenna to another. And we can use that data to ask questions about rates of movement and how long fish are spending uh, in different uh, parts of the watershed. This data is all for 2015. Um, and then again, we had something similar in 2016. Um, again, there's way too much to get into here, but you can see that the pattern of migration just in the visual counts was very different in 2016. It was a really sort of weird and warm year. It actually, it was challenging for us to get out and tag fish because they were sort of running at low numbers through a large period. Um, I won't play this animation just in the interest of time, but they're basically going to do the same thing. They sort of go up and uh, spawn and then come back down. Um, and so if we look at the track uh, for an individual fish, what we see is something like this. So on the x-axis there, that's time. And then as you go uh, on the y-axis there, those are different antennas that the fish is being seen at. So um, the fish is uh, hitting the sort of middle antennas and getting up to Pumas Pond, spending a while in Pumas Pond, and then going back down, back up to sea. Um, and if you notice something interesting about this, it's that they're spending a decent amount of time in fresh water. So um, it looked like, on average, it was about a month. So fish are up there for a decent amount of time. And that's really something that we didn't have any good data for. And actually, sort of regionally, we don't have good data on it at all. So it's something that sort of informs the larger sort of scientific body of knowledge. Um, and this is potentially important for nutrient cycling and things like that. And uh, in both years, we saw fairly consistent that they were there for about a month. Another interesting thing about this track is that relative to the amount of time that fish are spending in the pond, they're moving through the river really quickly. So they're getting into the river and swimming as fast as they can. Um, there are some fish. So here I'm showing you the total time it took for a fish to go from our lowest antenna up to Kudamesa Pond. And uh, essentially what you see is that um, there are some fish that take many, many hours, but most fish are taking a relatively short amount of time. So there's some fish that are sort of checking things out and looking at the estuary and things like that. But mostly they're taking a short time. And if we look drill down on that group of fish who are going quickly, what we see is that they're sort of moving in two different groups. Um, so most of them are going, about half of them are going quickly up, and then there's a second group that sort of reaches the, the end of their migration about 24 hours, uh, after about 24 hours. Um, and that that's sort of uh, what we think is another really interesting uh, thing that we've come out with in this study. And in case anybody asks, we were kind of thinking about a way to incorporate for adopters, you know, comparing fish speed and things like that, but we didn't quite get to it. But our fastest fish did the whole uh, whole migration in about uh, five hours, which is pretty fast for a little fish. Yeah. So it's quite, quite quick. Um, so that interesting sort of two groups of, um, of uh, times, lengths in migration corresponds with another really interesting thing, which uh, is that most of the detections that we're getting at all of the antennas are at night. So this is showing uh, the hour in the day in which our antennas were seeing uh, the different uh, fish. And so what we see is that it's mostly happening in the early morning, right before dawn, and then sort of in the early evening as the sun is setting. And that really 
sort of matches up with what uh, Lou and the other counters have been seeing, and it's great because it sort of lets us go to the state and say, hey guys, we actually saw this. We're not, you know, and we're seeing it at multiple different sites. It's not just where we're counting. So this is a similar graph, but I've broken the, uh, broken the data down by the different antennas. And you can see that there's some variation among sites in uh, when detections are most frequent, but uh, it's fairly consistent across them. Um, and so, some of you may have guessed why, why these fish are moving at night. If you're a small fish and you're out, you're out there, uh, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of space to hide. So, <laughs> um, it's something to think about and improve for the future. Um, so, um, if we compare and look at uh, some interesting information about the actual fish that we were tagging, uh, we had both blueback and alewife, predominantly alewife, and um, the alewives, as we expect, sort of show up a little bit earlier. Um, in 2016, again, it was sort of a strange year, so the fish that we actually tagged are shown in these two graphs, and uh, the blueback and alewives this year actually showed up almost at the same time, which is really interesting. Um, and we had a larger proportion of blueback this year, too. Um, just in terms of size, the alewives tended to be a little bit larger, and um, females in general tended to be a little bit larger, which is sort of what we'd expect from these species, but it's interesting to see in this data set, too. Um, one really interesting thing, because we've been conducting this study for multiple years, we got to actually have some fish from last year that were tagged go out to sea and then come back and uh, spawn. So there were fish from 2015 that returned, and um, it was a relatively high proportion of the fish that we had seen go back out to the estuary. So of the fish in 2015 who had gone back out to sea, about a quarter of them were seen again this year, uh, which is really kind of neat. And there were some sort of... Uh, um, Tantalizing th bits in the data there. A lot of the fish that we had seen again had made relatively short migrations in 2015, so it's possible that they maybe skip spawn, meaning that they came in, looked at the conditions, and decided, oh, maybe not this year, but maybe next year. So there's interesting um, things that we can pull out with additional data. Um, in total, about 90% of the fish that made it to a uh, one of the two terminal spawning ponds went to Kudamesa Pond. So at this point, in the, um, I don't, we don't know why, but it seems like most of the fish that are making it are going to Kudamesa Pond. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's necessarily something better about it, but for some reason that's where they're ending up. Um, and interestingly, um, we didn't have many bluebacks actually make it to ponds. So many of the bluebacks are staying in the lower watershed, which is a little bit consistent with what we know about their life history. Um, and I'll, I'll throw this in here. Uh, to that some of the fish also, there's a section of, um, of ponds halfway up, and some of the fish will go there, sort of hang out, and then come back down to. So we don't know if they're spawning there, but that's a possibility. Um, one really interesting thing, too, is that only about 50% uh, of the fish that we were tagging um, were making it up to the ponds. So in the first year, we were thinking, oh, you know, we're sort of new to this, maybe we're not doing this correctly, but because it was seen in both years, um, we're starting to think that there could be other uh, sort of other possible reasons. So um, one, probably it's a combination of reasons. Mortality likely plays a role. These fish are tasty morsels for a lot of predators, and undoubtedly some of them are getting eaten on their way out. But also uh, fish spawning lower in the watershed and sort of skip spawning or fallback or other possibilities too. So that's something that we're still <laughs> interested in attacking. And, um, I'm going to reiterate some of the take-home points because I went kind of quickly, um, but my main take-home point is there's a lot of interesting things, so if you're curious about something, send me an email, <laughs> and we can work on it. Um, so basically, the most interesting thing, I think, was that the movement really is going on mostly at night. So these fish are out there, they're going upstream under the cover of darkness, it probably has something to do with the fact that they're, you know, protected a bit from visual predators at that point. Um, really, at this point, these fish are moving really quickly through the watershed, um, and that a relatively uh, uh, small amount of them are actually making it to the pond. So of the fish that were making it up to, say, the counting station, maybe only 50% of those are making it to a pond. So that, that's really interesting. Um, we also saw some repeat spawning, which was really cool. So fish being seen in multiple years. And it'll be really interesting to see if we see that again this year. Um, and then, I didn't have time to put slides in, but if people are curious about this, ask me about it. Um, we also did, in 2015, look at whether or not culverts were delaying fish, and it did look like the culverts that we looked at 
were sort of uh, making fish slow down, and they were being detected more on the lower side of them than on the upper side of them. Um, and then um, this year we also looked at uh, sort of fish choice between two different options. At one point the river splits and fish can go up sort of a nature-like fish way or up uh, an Alaskan steep pass, and it looked like fish, for the most part, preferred the nature-like fish way. So that, that was quite interesting. Um, there are some nuances there too. But um, the future, I'll, this is a little bit um, uh, general, but um, I think, and I think the rest of the group thinks that a lot of this information is really interesting, it's valuable for conservation efforts, and we're uh, planning to continue it in the foreseeable future. Um, and we're really interested in using this data set in conjunction with the restoration plans to sort of ask about uh, what the effect of the restoration is. So I think it's a unique, interesting project for that reason. Um, and we also have lots of, we have no shortage of other questions, and you might, you might have <laughs> got that in the way that I presented this, but um, yeah. Well, that'll leave you with a picture of fish. Sure. Do the tags last in the fish long enough for you to find out what they do when they get back to Nantucket Sound? Uh, I wish they did. So these tags, they're really, you have a trade-off. So there are tags out there that have batteries in them that um, will sort of report, and you can record over a longer distance. Um, and so those people have used effectively to study fish and estuaries. These tags and the antennas that record them are, um, could only be so big, so they work really well in streams and other places, but if we were to put them out in the estuary or someplace else, it would be hard, hard to cover the, the whole area with an antenna. It would be a much larger operation. Um, but that is a really interesting question. It would be nice to know what they're doing out there. So this question, my question is about, uh, you, you keep talking about bluebacks and alewife. It's sort of maybe separate, yeah. but they're all actually behaving in the same vibration. Yeah. Uh, so the only thing that you actually mentioned that differentiates them behaviorally was the location that the bluebacks may be spawning in versus the alewife. Is that? Are there any exper Is there any experimental evidence about you know fertilization, uh, yeah, differential fertilization? Yeah, yeah. So they will hybridize, um, and it gets into a really interesting sort of genetics question where you can have you know. Um, back crosses and other, you know, interesting sort of intermediate fish out there, um, but it, it gets complicated really quickly. <laughs> um, the even some of the phenotypic characters which we usually use, sorry, the, the sort of um, the traits that we look at to differentiate them um, are not super reliable if you start looking at hybrids. So it gets interesting, but generally you do have these two sort of um, separate phenotypes and species that exist. Why are they just morphs or are they species? They're, they're, well, you, that is a really interesting question. There are long, interesting debates about how you define species and things like that. I think, um, you know, these guys functionally are, in the same way you look at, you know, a cardinal and a blue jay and call them different species. These guys are that separate. Hi, I'm Mike Hoffman. I'm from Boston. Uh, my question is uh, basically on trawlers. So how do they affect uh, herring? Is there limits on it? And if so, uh, <laughs> um, how can we regulate that? That is an interesting and complicated question, too, that I am surprisingly <laughs> not an expert in. But um, there is a lot of concern that their interactions, that these species are um, taken as uh, bycatch in, um, say, the Atlantic herring fishery. Um, and there you know, has been recent sort of management action on that front. Um, if you Google Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Council and River Herring, you'll get a, a good rundown, and it'll do better justice than I can here, but that's that's sort of the state of the process right now, and it's sort of a contentious, contentious issue. Well, it's certainly frustrating <clears throat> when we're trying to rebuild the stock and find out that they're catching millions and millions of pounds of these, yeah, and yeah. paying cat food out of them, something should be done. Yeah, I, it's... It's tough. Um, I think that it's one of those things where um, there are definitely strong opinions on it. So the real, it looks like the numbers for bycatch, this is my uneducated impression, is that the numbers for bycatch are such that as a coastwide sort of population or even a distinct group for say like the Gulf of Maine, um, alewife or blueback are not potentially threatened by the volume of bycatch that occurs. Um, but you do potentially have 
Um, you know, you could potentially have sort of serial depletion where you have a fishing boat catch most of one population, if all of one population, say the Kuna Mesa fish are all schooling together. So there are really interesting research projects that are going on to try to understand whether or not, you know, fish from a single population are schooling out at sea. So 